I'm going to do a video fixing my iPhone 6 here. I know this video doesn't quite fit with a lot of the other repair videos I do, but the cell phone's an important piece of equipment because it's how my customers even get a hold of me in the first place. So the problem with this phone is it's got a crack in the screen, but I don't mind that. But now the last thing that happened is there's a lot of areas of the screen that don't recognize touch anymore. And it's kind of like a line right up in this area here. like like right around here you can't it just doesn't recognize touch and it's very annoying when you're trying to type something or use a lot of apps or so I'm pretty sure it needs a new touch screen so I got the new part here's a new screen I just ordered this on eBay it was pretty cheap and uh, the other problem it's had for years now is the speaker is bad and what I do is whenever I'm using a making a phone call I'll just put it on speakerphone and that works fine but so I got the new uh, replacement speaker as well. So I'll try to put that in it too. So there's a guy in the mall that fixes these, but um, he's probably really good at it because he sits there doing that and only that all day, every day. And um, I've never done this before, but let's, uh, I'm going to try to do it. So, so here's um, all the tools. So both parts actually came with these tool kits were like a few dollars it was really cheap so so uh, I think the first thing you do is there's two screws on the bottom of the phone here that got to come out alright so for filming stuff very close up with the GoPro camera I use this macro lens to make it not blurry so to start I think there's two screws here that need to come out You know, that's incredible how small that screw is. Okay, now I think you use the suction cup to pull the screen off. should turn this off before like unplugging the screen out of it let's do that all right that's probably a good idea all right so actually i did have this apart once before i put this battery in it a month a couple months ago So here's the old speaker. And the new one looks the same. That's good. Get this off.
right, so here's the new screen here. And here is the old one. And it looks like I have to transfer a few parts from this one to the new one. Oh, I got to oh, this whole metal plate has to come off of this. Wow, okay. I finally got all these screws out. These screwdrivers included with this kit are not very good quality. I have this one, but that was too big, but I had to really push hard to get it. That's it. Okay, I'm done taking parts off of that. So here's the home button. And that goes right there. So I was going to change. Here's the front camera. I was going to change that. But it's full of dust. But I think I could just clean it here. This thing here looks like it's already on this one. It's right, that's this thing. This one looks. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what I'm. I didn't even watch any instructions, which I probably should have. All right, so I'm taking this off of here. I don't know if I'm supposed to, but all right, so that's out of the way. So let's just put this on. All right, so I'm gonna put this plate on here now. All right, so I'm having a hard time picking up these extremely small screws. So one trick, you could take a magnet and then do that. Now that will make your screwdriver magnetic and the screws will stick to it. I think this plate went right here. Having this, this screwdriver magnetic is so much easier. But the screwdriver is still not very good because Now we're on this end. Alright, I think everything is together on the new screen, so now I just got to join the two halves. Let's try it. Well, that's a good sign. All right, let's see. Well, 
It's um that's working. Let's see. Um let's try I, I not that I ever cared about the front camera, but let's see if that works. Um front camera. Yeah, hey, and it's not all blurry. Nice. Okay. And um is the screen working everywhere? Let's see. All right, let's just, uh, all right, these are the buttons that didn't work. Turn the sound on. Yeah, it was like, I remember like, I, all these buttons on this side. Well, it looks like it's fixed. I guess let me try the, uh, let me try making a phone call. All right, that was successful. Let me just put these bottom two screws back in it. So I got this box in the mail today. Um, a few videos ago, I did that video on that hot water pressure washer I bought, and it was the first time running a brand new machine, and it had a few issues with it in the beginning. And the um, the owner of that company, I guess, saw the video and sent me this letter. You know, he gave me a few pieces of advice, and he, you know, thanked me. He's like, "Well, you know, that was nice. You just had a few issues with it in the beginning." But, um, you know, didn't return it, just just dealt with it and fixed it. So he sent me some new stickers for the side because they were peeling off. And, um, and he sent me this, which is nice, this rotary nozzle. So that, you know, that's a real nice, you know, that, that was cool of him to do that. So just an update on my phone. It's been probably a couple weeks since I fixed this and still working great. One thing that did happen, though, immediately, this new screen... I don't know if you can see it on the camera. It cracked. But, yeah, I, I don't really care that it's cracked. I don't know what happened to make it crack. Maybe the glass isn't as strong in these aftermarket ones or something. But I also got this case. Now, I think if it was in this case, I don't think every, anything would have happened to it in the first place. Because this is, they're calling it waterproof. But I'm not really planning on taking it swimming. But it's really dust proof is the big deal, too. Because the dust is what's really hurt it. So this, it's got these covers that go over the... The charging ports when you're not using them and um, you know the whole case is, is sealed up that's really how it should be because you know the dust is a big problem so I'll put a link in the description for this phone case it was pretty cheap too so well at least that repair went well I would definitely attempt to repair a cell phone again all right so a couple updates with my camera gear I just got this thing so this is a new stabilized camera and I like it better than this GoPro one and I'll explain why so this one here it's, it's just quicker and easier to use, but the problem with the GoPro one was that the audio was terrible with it, and you couldn't even plug in an external microphone, which was really frustrating because it actually has a plug on it, which the external microphone adapter plugs into, but it just doesn't work. This one gets excellent audio, and it even has a spot on the side here for an external mic, but you, you don't even need it. The mic that's built into it is good. So what I was doing was I'd use this, and then I'd use this audio recorder, and, and this gets good audio, but then what was taking a really long time in editing was syncing up the audio from this thing to the video files from this. It was just editing is really taking a lot of time and that was that was taking a lot of it so so this this is great this new thing and I'll, I'll go walk around with it I'll show you the difference between this one and this one and the other thing I got is a new drone so this is the new one here on the right the last time I put out a video talking about camera gear this drone came out that day the next day and I ordered it within the first week and I like it a little bit better than that drone Alright, so there they both are unfolded. I mean, I'll quickly go over. Um, you know, this one can still fly longer and further, but th this one flies long and far enough, and it's got a few advantages. The camera's better on it, and it's just a little easier to deploy. So this is still a great drone, but I've pretty much just been using this one now. Uh, but I'll, I'll put the links in the description for both of these. And I'll also put the link in the description for this thing because that's one thing that would really help a lot of people out because if you're walking around with a video camera it really has to be a stabilized camera 
because here I'm just holding this GoPro, but when, unless you're really thinking about it, it it's going to be shaky. But with this thing, it's perfect every time. So let's go outside and I'll show you the difference between these two cameras. All right, so I'm holding both of those uh, cameras right now and I'll show you the difference. Mo mostly the difference is with the audio. The, the GoPro camera works completely fine, just the audio is terrible. So here we are with the GoPro camera. So you hear that background noise with the audio that's there constantly. See, come here. Come here. So you hear that background noise that's with the audio constantly. Okay, so now here we are. This is the, the re, I don't even know how to pronounce it. R-E-M-O-V-U. Re, Removo. Removo K1. And, um, you know, the audio is fine. It isn't even with an external mic. It's just the way it is, so. Um, so I'm going to be using this from now on just because it's that much quicker to edit with. And uh, it's been a while. Check out that beaver dam. That thing is huge now. Not really affecting us too much on this side. A lot of the other neighbors are getting pretty annoyed about it. but and Because um, our, our side's pretty high. So, it's, you know, we lost 50 feet. But I, I don't really care. Oh, Sadie's in the water. Sadie, come Sadie. All right, so I had a few people ask about this. Here is that tree I moved here last year. So it's not looking great, but it's not, you know, it's still alive. So, I mean, it's probably only got leaves on 70% of the branches. So, you know, I guess we'll just see what happens. But, you know, this job, I wasn't there to move a tree. They just, they just said cut it down. So I just quickly moved it here, so. See with the stabilized camera you can walk around you know there's no way you could do this with a regular camera actually here let's leave him run Sadie come on let's run come here come here come here all right another thing people throw out all the time when they stop working are these especially this model in particular and I like fixing these because you can usually get these running in a few minutes. Now, there's more stuff that happens to them, but this model, these Briggs and Stratton's with this type of gas tank and the plastic carburetor, there's a diaphragm in there that goes bad. This is it. This diaphragm only lasts about three or four years, and people throw these out. It's like a $3 part. So there's the part number there. So I'll show you how easy it is to install that. Learning how to fix push mowers is a real good way to make money because people are always throwing them out so you can always get them for free and people always need them because you go buy a new one, it's expensive. Alright, so that's the carburetor and gas tank assemblies off, that easy. So I have a little compressed air. I should actually... Alright, see this here? That will make it overheat. You got to make sure you get all that stuff out of there. Spring goes right there. All right, so these diaphragms, they look fine, but like they just stretch out like a little bit and they don't work, so. Okay, so the diaphragm goes down, that side goes on the metal, and this gasket goes right there. 
And that's ready to go back in. Okay, make sure those O-rings are there. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff to this, but that's the main thing is that diaphragm. All right, now the carburetor can go back on. they have a broken one bring it as a trade-in you know give them depending on what they're bringing you give them a little bit of money off the sale on this the price on this one and before selling these to someone it's a good idea to mow some lawn with it just to make sure it's not going to stop running in two minutes Nice. Hey, let's try a bit of a challenge here. Something really old. All right, so on the Briggs and Stratton's, the first two numbers of the last number are the year. So that would make this a 1965. That's pretty old. Let's see if we can get it running. I just think it needs the carburetor clean. Or not clean. I think it needs the carburetor rebuilt. New diaphragms in it. Alright, so I ordered these parts a while back ago. So let's see what they gave me. Um, an O-ring. Another flat O-ring. Another O-ring. A diaphragm. Now this is, this is probably all it needs right here. And then here's the gasket for the tank. Let's see if we could just throw that diaphragm in there and see if this will start. Not too bad. All right, so that's going to be under this cover right here. All right, so you can see why this wasn't running. See, these are like gaskets or diaphragm, or probably like check valves. That's the best way to describe these parts. And see how they're destroyed? So there's no way this engine would have ran, so. All right, so there's the new part. There's the old one. That's good, they look the same. Make sure these surfaces are relatively clean. You know, that's not perfectly clean, but there's no big pieces of gasket stuck to it, so that should be alright. You know, let's just put this back on and see if it runs. So all the way forward you could, is run, and that puts the choke on too. Alright, now I take off 
off the choke. I've got the, this thing, it fired a few times, but it wouldn't run. So I got the carburetor back off of it. Let me, uh, in the gas tank, and let me try putting some more parts in it this time. I got this old O-ring, took that out of there, there's a new one. I blew all these jets out. Put this in. Now that goes in there. Now, the way you do these, and I think this was the issue. So you take that, you tighten it all the way. You don't tighten it tight. Then you go out one and a half turns. So half, one, one and a half. And then you try to start it, and then you can adjust it from there. But this was only out like half of a, a turn or less. I think that was the problem. All right, so let me put this all back together now. All right, so I couldn't get this started last night. I just put a new spark plug in it. This one was sparking, but just looks kind of wet. And um, I brought it outside. The thing started on the first pull. So let's give it a try. So that works pretty well. I got to do a few more little things to it. The handle that controls the auger is broken, so I got to make a new handle. That's no big deal. And I should probably change the motor oil and the gear oil. But other than that, this thing's ready to go. All right, I just changed this wheel that was bad. So there's a new one. So now let me touch up the paint on this thing. Caterpillar yellow. All right, I just got this all finished up. So I uh, did a quick spray paint on it. I just replaced this one wheel that was bad. This lever was broken, so I made that new lever, so that works well. And uh, I changed the engine oil and I topped off the gear oil in the auger gears there. So let's give this thing a try. Put it on choke. So that project was definitely worth doing. I found this on the side of the road for free and I got about $20 into it. And I don't know, probably less than an hour. Let's see how it starts up right now. Yeah, that thing runs good. All right, and I wasn't even gonna make a video about this, but my vacuum cleaner the other day, it um, it had been make, it had been really loud for a while. Then all, all of a sudden, it lost suction, but the motor was still running and the brush 
was still turning, but I immediately knew what it was. So um, I took it apart, which was really easy, and um, it was the impeller. So you can see the impeller here, the inside of it, like just melted off the shaft. This is where it went on that right here. So this was just spinning freely. It wasn't actually turning. So I know a lot of people would be real quick to just throw this in the trash and go buy another vacuum. And I, I've never even paid for a vacuum cleaner or a lot of things like that because I would just go, I'd get stuff like this out of the trash. And a lot of the times you could fix this, you know, something like this out of the garbage and it'd be easy to, you know, usually you wouldn't even have to spend any money, but I've been using this for years and it broke. So I just wanted to fix it. So, um, so first I was searching like to get the parts right. First I was searching like the model and model number for it, but I was, I mean, I was, wasn't having luck. And then I, so then I found a number on the uh, part itself, which that's, that's usually a good way to get parts. So I typed that number in on Google and ordered the part. So the new one, the new one's a little different, but it's probably just a newer version of the part. It's hopefully it's better. I think it is better because I think this one only ever had plastic threads in here and they must have realized it was a bad design because they changed it. So this one here actually has a metal nut worked into there. I, I don't see a nut on this one. Um, you know, it, it would still be stuck on that shaft probably. It's not there. So, so anyway, so let's put this back together. So that just threads on there, reverse threads, and you don't even really need to tighten this. The second you turn that on, that's going to tighten it. So let's put this, I took this apart like a week ago, but. So that went. All right, so now, so now this goes. So that must go on there. That goes right there. And that goes like that. And so now these retainers go on. back in. Turn in it. Okay, that's fine. Now I think the two halves can go together, so this rubber seal goes here. And this goes. Probably should have unplugged this before I worked on it. But. All right, now this screw holds the two halves together. All right, now I think this just snaps on. All right, 
She's all fixed. I thought this thing was fixed. It was working, but it was grinding. Um, I got it back apart. Here's the motor. This bearing right here, that's bad. So here's the same bearing on this side. You can see it's good, but this one's got a lot of play in it. And what was happening, um, this is the side that had the impeller and it was moving all over the place and then it was the, the motor was grinding and it was even taking chunks off the inside of the motor so the motor and all this is all still good it just needs this bearing but it's not really a serviceable thing it's kind of this there's a plate that holds it on and uh this and this is a rivet so i guess i got to drill out these rivets to get to get that bearing out of there can see it's got a little bit of movement you know that's a bad bearing because that was making the the motor hit the, on the inside and uh, I should have filmed this this thing was shooting sparks out and stuff it was pretty cool but here's the new bearing here so you can see that one's nice and tight so they look the same all right so let's put this back together so this bearing was It was just down in there. Let's see if I can jump this around enough to get it to get it to land in the spot. All right, that's in there. Now this plate was on. All right, so this thing was held together with these rivets. So I'll try. I'll try doing the same. The rivet's a little small for the hole that it's going through, so I got to use this washer on the inside. So, all right. Well, there it is all together. So that should be all right. All right, so let me put this motor back together. All right, so the, the tricky part is you got, you got to hold these brushes apart so you can put this in here, but there, there's no way to hold them on it. Usually you can hold the wire back, but... All right, I had it almost together, but look, here's the old bearing. Slides right over that just fine. The new one, it does not. I don't, I mean, they... The bearing numbers are different, but supposedly they're the same size. Um, so I don't know, maybe I'm gonna try sand. I was just polishing this. I'm gonna try sanding this down a little bit more. All right, that looks pretty good. Let me try putting this together again. All right, so that's in there all the way now. That's good. So now this needs to go back. All right, I'm just going to throw that on there. I think that's how that one. All 
All right, the uh, light was burnt out for a long time, so I got a new light bulb for it. Right, that's in. All right, this can go on. Is it still plugged in? Should I leave it plugged in? It makes it more interesting, right? They're all, all unplugged at this time. Let's run the motor and listen to it before I put that top cover on. Locked up, huh? All right, I figured out the issue. This washer here, do not leave out that washer. It goes right there. If that washer is not there, this fan motor tightens down and locks everything together. Now, look, that's all the way, that's all the way tight and it spins. All right, that sounds pretty good. You know, it's not grinding, it's not shooting sparks out of it. I'm confident it's fixed this time. So there's one more thing I wanted to talk about, and um, really it deserves its own video, but it, all it is is going to be talk, so I'm just going to hide it at the end of this video. Alright, so I want to talk about how cars are made, and then, and all the problems with them, why they don't last long enough, and then talk about how they should be made. Come here. Alright, so, I'm going to start with the body on the... On, now, I'm not picking on Dodges here. I'm just, I'm kind of complaining about how every vehicle is made. Like a car and truck is, for most people, probably the most expensive or the second most expensive thing they own. And really, if you look at it, cars and trucks, what do they probably last on average? Maybe 14 years or so? You know, if, if your house only lasted 14 years, that would be completely unacceptable if every material in the house just went bad because of time or use. All right, so I'm going to walk around this car and talk about all the issues with the body and why it, it only lasts such a short amount of time. So f first, building the whole body out of sheet metal like this. What I mean, essentially, the way they start building cars is they start with big rolls of sheet metal. And then they make big stamps, and they'll stamp out all these body panels. And, yeah, I know it looks kind of nice, sort of, but they get dented up so quick. You touch one little thing with the body, and it's dented. The other thing is, it's just sheet metal. It's not galvanized or anything, and it rusts out bad, quick. You know, if you look at this, um, you know, the rockers here, you know, they disintegrated years ago, and... Um, so generally what, what you do is you take a, a big piece of tubing and go down the whole thing and then, then screw some uh, aluminum diamond plate down on top of it. And You know, the, what it should be built out of is aluminum like this because this will never rust and, I mean, that's the whole thing. It doesn't rust. I mean, that's the whole problem with building it out of steel is the steel rusts out. Plus, it's heavy. The aluminum, you know, I don't care if it costs a drop more. It's, it's, um... It's worth it. And I know people are going to say, okay, well, you know, they started making some pickup truck bodies out of aluminum. And you're right, they have. But the issue I've been seeing with those is they're using the thinnest aluminum they possibly could. It might as well be made out of a beer can because it just, they, they're not thick enough. It just gets destroyed. So, you know, there's plenty of commercial vehicles with aluminum bodies and the bodies last forever. That's how they should be. So let's talk about like bumpers and plastic pieces and unnecessary trim pieces. So this front bumper here, I, you know, it's all it is is like a stamped piece of sheet metal with some plastic all, all around, you know, just unnecessary decorative plastic. All right, so here's a good example of how the front end of a vehicle could be. No nonsense plastic pieces that break for, for no reason, no tin foil. Just nice big steel. So, you know, this is just C-channel. It's not some crazy engineered stamped out crazy piece. That's something at any steel yard you could go to and pick it up. You know, a nice grill, that just diamond plate to protect the front end. Non, 
you know, non-standard, you know, like the big problem with a lot of cars is they always use like their specialty lights that only fit that make of car for that amount of years. That's a terrible idea because they always get smashed, sticking them right in the corner, and then you have to get the part f for that vehicle. Really what they should have is just like a standard light like this. Like this is just something you can get in an auto parts store. It's not in the very corner where it gets smashed. So put, you put one on, on the side and then you put them on the front. That's a much better design. But yeah, see the whole vehicle could be built like this with with tubing and just regular normal steel from a steel yard and it'd be much cheaper to put together and much 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 stronger. You know, if you did away with all this tin foil and you know this this tubing like see that could continue back to the car, then you'd have your your windshield hoop here here, then go down to the frame tubing. You just and then what you could do is you'd fill in the panels between like that would be like a flat piece of aluminum or something that would never rust out and if it ever got smashed for whatever reason you could just unbolt the flat piece of metal and change it out easily. I'm gonna put this up on a lift to talk about all the design flaws on the bottom of it and this this pertains to every truck doesn't matter foreign domestic all of them they all have these same terrible designs. Another thing I want to talk about too is how pickup trucks are built. Look, they only have that little section of frame in the very bottom there. So when I pick this up, it bends the whole thing because, you know, the, the body's not attached up at the top like it should be. You'll see towards the end of the video, I built this little model truck that I wanted to build 10 years ago, you know, full scale. And essentially it's a tube chassis vehicle. A practical tube chassis vehicle which I've never seen every time you see a tube chassis vehicle it's always some specialty vehicle that's good for some event that's pointless but it's not I've never seen a practical tube chassis vehicle so but this here I mean you could see I've had one time I had a Chevy Colorado on here and the thing was beautiful looking it was like a 05 so you know it was only a 15 year old car we lifted it up the thing broke right in half you know just because it's not one, it was a terrible frame design by Chevy, but, um, you know, it rusted, and it's just, it's not attached good enough. I mean, you've never seen an SUV break in half, because the body holds everything together. All right, so let's finish lifting this up. We're underneath this pickup truck here, and I want to talk about all the design flaws so we'll start in the back here so I always kinda like leaf springs you know it's a pretty good design but a straight axle like this you know independent suspension would be a lot better it just rides a lot better and especially with a lot of travel but you know we'll go back here so you know you got all these different layers of metal you got like your your hitch then you got your bumper I mean really that should the hitch should be built right into the bumper um, a big complaint I have is with rust so you know the the whole frame being built out of these really weird pieces stamped and and just you know rusting right out you know that's a big design flaw because it makes the vehicles unsafe so um you know i i think all the steel one it, it shouldn't be f shaped so complicated you know what what's the reason for having all these weird curves and stuff you know this could just be like a nice piece of two by four square stock going straight down the whole frame all right so let's talk about uh the electrical wiring you know they just take the electrical wiring stick it in a plastic conduit and then just zip tie it to the frame you know that's not good enough in a building they make you take all the wiring it's got to be in steel inside steel conduit so nothing can damage it no mice can chew it nothing can hit it and smash it the weather doesn't get to it for some reason in vehicles, they think it's okay just to put it in a plastic sheathing. So I, that's one thing I've had to fix a few times on this truck is just wires that have gone bad for no reason. And then, you know, we got a lot of rust issues. Muffler rusting out. You know, the U-joints always go bad. Um, I don't think vehicles need U-joints or drive shafts. I'll mention that at the end of the video, how, how the drive could be done. But all these parts could be eliminated in the ideal vehicle. You know, so these tank straps, I've had them rust out before. I've changed them before because the gas tank has fallen out on this thing. You know, there's the muffler completely rusting out. 
you know the transmissions always kind of wet leaking at least on this truck you know they did a decent job protecting it with these skid plates I've seen some cars where there's always something hanging down and you take it off road and you 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 break things right off the bottom you know I've, at least I've never had any issues with this breaking and then and then the frame so I've had to repair this frame I mean I should probably stop driving this truck pretty soon but I'm waiting for it to, so this is about broken right here and I've, I've rebarred it back together but you know that I don't see how that's allowed but they should make Dodge or all the car companies replace the frames and, and vehicles that rust out like this for free because it's you know that should be illegal to build something and have it rust out that quickly you know these control arm mounts I've had them rip right off the frame before I've that's been welded back on you know this straight axle I'm, I'm not a big fan of straight axles they don't really handle that well you know I think it should be independent suspension a big issue with new cars too is the way they're wired they over engineer the wiring harnesses so much in new cars you know they don't need to be a hundred percent computer controlled really all that is is I mean this thing there's always tons of lights on in the dashboard for no reason usually there's even more than this this is that's a good day when there's only four on um, but none of those lights and computers and sensors do anything they just ruin the vehicle it's just over engineered and you know a good example of a vehicle with no nonsense electronics is, is this thing right here if you look at the the wiring on this it's so much simpler because this is from the 72 really the technology in, in 1972 is so much better than the technology in new cars just this usually the simpler something is the better it's gonna work and um, making cars as complicated as they can make them is just it's just like a failure it's like an engineering disaster really so I, I think it'd be easy to design a vehicle that would have a 60 plus year lifespan under normal circumstances and probably an indefinite life with someone just taking care of it because it'd be easy to fix and designed really simple and it wouldn't get all smashed up and rust out for no reason so now let's talk about how I think vehicles should be built so 10 years ago now I made this model of what I thought would be the perfect truck chassis the whole idea you see a lot of cool tube chassis vehicles out there, but whenever you see a tube chassis vehicle, it's always like some type of specialty vehicle, like a race car or some type of off-roader, and it's, it's never a practical vehicle. It's always just for doing some type of specific event and nothing else. So that's, that's pretty much worthless, even though the, the tube chassis design is nice because it's often you can flip them over and crash them, and the you know it's a lot safer for the uh you know the vehicle doesn't crush up like a tin foil you know like tin foil like the way cars are built now so this chassis here the whole plan was to keep it as simple as possible and i had every intent on building this i didn't think it was going to be that hard i know machining a lot of the axles and stuff that would have been hard so my plan was to get the, uh, i wanted it to have independent suspension so i was just going to get the suspension off a of humvee which I thought would be pretty good because it was already a tested design and um, and and, the, and all the parts were available so um, but I, I just never did it but really the way it should be done is not stealing parts from another vehicle it's just let me explain why I did what I did here so this chassis if you if you count the pieces here it really wouldn't be that many and there's no crazy bends or anything like putting this together could be done by almost really any welding shop you know you could just really make a jig for this and slap this together pretty quick um, so this would scale up I think this was a 120 of scale and I would keep it exactly like this so you would have all this really big tubing so um, you know the, the front so the, the main frame here is really narrow that way with the independent suspension you'd have room for very long control arms and you'd be able to have a ton of wheel travel I would use torsion bars as the springs and probably have them on the upper control arms like the like the early 90s Toyotas because that was nice because with torsion bars you can adjust the ride height very easily just by tightening a bolt and um, 
and I've never had a problem with torsion bars. They don't like I've had coil springs go bad. I've had leaf springs break and stuff, but never torsion bars are much better designed. So, you know, the bumper, it's not like on a regular car, you kind of have like your frame and then you got a layer of tin foil body and then you have like a layer of plastic and then just a lot of layers of very complicated folded pressed nonsense. This would be very simple. So your, your very front bar here, you would just have this, you know, this very big pipe. Then, you know, then this would get, this would be like your grill. I mean, the, the whole thing is made out of two by four and then I think four inch square tubing. Um, so let's talk about the, so the main thing I want to do here, the suspension and the, the wheels. So what I want to do, I want to have independent suspension and let's talk about electric drive for a little bit. Now, I know a lot of people think that's some kind of nonsense thing for green cars to not pollute the environment or whatever. That, that's not really the, the case. The electric motors in a vehicle are better than a gas or diesel motor in every way. They are... Now, now take the batteries right out of the equation. With electric motors, they can. you don't need a transmission with them because they can run at a big enough RPM range where you can just have one gear and go from start to full speed and not have to change gears a bunch of times like you would with a gas or diesel engine. And they can start from nothing, so you don't even need a clutch or a torque converter or anything to ever have to uncouple the drive motor from the, the wheels. So that takes a ton of moving parts out of the, out of the chassis. The other thing that's great about them, they can run the other direction. So you don't need a reverse gear. You can just have the electric motor hooked right to the wheels and it can run backwards as well. And they can do the braking. And not only when they're braking, they are taking that energy and storing it. So if you built the entire truck electric, you almost wouldn't need brakes on it because 99% of the time, you could just be using the electric motors to do all the braking. And electric motors, there's not much to them, so they'd almost be a maintenance-free maintenance -free thing where you'd never have to do anything. There'd be no oil changes, nothing. It'd be extremely simple. So the other thing I want to do, which I've seen done on some RC cars and stuff, but um, and there's another company out there right now who's really – got a lot for I'm just talking there they have built vehicles built and they're really trying to start a company and a lot of people haven't seen them it's the Bollinger B1 and there's a lot of stuff that they did that I like but one thing I would try to do they like even the Teslas like they'll have the electric motors they still have like a differential in the center and they'll have the drive motor right on that differential I don't I think you could skip all that I think the electric motors if you put huge wheels on this vehicle which big wheels are nice for a bunch of reasons they're, they're better off-road and they just roll better so if you put really big wheels on this thing I think you'd be able to get the electric motors right into the hubs and then you wouldn't have any CV shafts or drive shafts or anything every wheel would have its own motor and it would it, it would just be really simple because you'd have a ton, then you'd be able to have a ton of suspension travel and a ton of steering travel and it would it should be a very reliable system like that so right now if the vehicle was electric which the the best way to power electric motors right now would be like a lithium battery so you'd be able to utilize this space down in here under the passenger compartment and put a bunch of batteries in there and it'd be nice in there because it would give the vehicle a very low center of gravity so, I mean, the best trucks have a low center of gravity with a high ground clearance, and, and I tried really hard to have that here. So it, it'd almost be, you'd be sitting nice and low in the chassis, but you'd have a ton of ground clearance, and the entire bottom of the vehicle would be completely flat. So you'd be able to drive over stuff, and um, you, you, the vehicle would never get hung up. And, and parts would never get ripped off the bottom. And, and again, with the electric, you got no exhaust, you got no fuel tank, you got nothing. And, and you'd have no, you wouldn't have any differentials, you wouldn't have any drive shafts. All right, so obviously this is just a skeleton of the vehicle. And I, I wouldn't put like some tinfoil body over this and ruin it. 
the way I'd fill in these body panels, I'd probably just do sheet aluminum. Like you could have an aluminum hood, aluminum grill. You know, this would be your glass, maybe glass here or another piece of aluminum. The floor of the bed could be aluminum. These sections could be aluminum. And that'd be nice because it would never rust out and they'd just be flat panels so they probably wouldn't ever get smashed up like the fancy stamped pressed, you know, tin foil the way trucks are currently made. And, um, you know, and even if they did get smashed, you know, they, you could just unbolt them and bolt in another piece. But, you know, that would never happen because all the corners of this vehicle would be the chassis. So really you could drive this thing through a house or you, you could go in a demolition derby with a bunch of other you know, brand new pickup trucks, and um, you could say everyone versus me, and you, you wouldn't even, this vehicle wouldn't even get damaged in a lot of accidents that would total, the, you know, a tin foil truck. Um, there's a lot of other rules you could use for putting this together that I think would make it a lot more reliable and have an indefinite life. Um, I mean, that's the whole plan here is to make this vehicle so it lasts forever. And to make it, you know, to say, all right, it's never gonna break. No, that's not the case. Things are gonna break, but you'd make it easy to work on. So, so the vehicle would be built so it's extremely easy to work on. You wouldn't have to be like a mechanic that had tons of hours of training and experience to work on this thing. Anyone that's just somewhat, with some skills would be able to do almost any job on this thing. You know, a lot of military vehicles are kind of built that way, but you know, it's hard to describe how to do it, but, you know, as you'd be putting it together, um, really that would make producing it a lot cheaper, too, because if it's put together simple, it's easier to build, so. So, you know, I'd have a bunch of rules. I mean, everything that went into the vehicle would have to be entirely waterproof. I don't see how that would, I really don't think that'd be hard to do. I mean, really, essentially what you'd be doing, really you're building a giant RC car, because there's a lot of cool electric RC cars that are available and they can drive underwater no problem and really this again with no gas or diesel motor you wouldn't need an air intake so this vehicle could work entirely underwater and if every part was waterproof you know you wouldn't have those issues where if an area floods you'd have thousands of, of vehicles that are garbage because they they got a little bit wet one time so i think that would really add to the add to the value of this the goal here would be like to mass produce these and another thing that I think would really help this vehicle out is a big problem they have with cars that they sell now is they'll build something and then they'll you know they'll sell it for like four years and then they'll change it and they're continuously changing it and you'll have like a pickup truck and there will be like 10 different ver or and you'll go buy a pickup truck and there'll be like four different motors that could be in it and, mul and then different transmissions behind each motor and then different trim packages and a bunch of unnecessary nonsense features that are just sold to fools essentially. So what I would do on this, I'd build them all the same. There wouldn't be different motors or different nonsense trims and stuff. It, every truck would be exactly the same. And the other thing, I, I wouldn't change them in four years or whatever. I'd try to make the one same truck as long as possible, you know, 30, 40, 50 years without changing it. That way you could have a truck that's 50 years old and apart from the brand new truck will fit right on it. And I think that would make building them a lot cheaper because you wouldn't be wasting all this money on research and development of new, new products all the time. Because if you're making something that's perfect, you could, um, you could just keep selling it. And, um, and the other thing that's great about that is then you get the time to get all the bugs out of it. Because, you know, you always want to avoid like a first year vehicle because there's always going to be issues and stuff with them. And then, you know, the, they'll, they'll work it out after the fact. But, you know, that, that's always a problem. So if you make the same thing for years, you know, say you realize that some parts kind of have issues on some trucks after a number of years and you'll, you'll revise a part to take care of that problem. You know that makes the vehicle that much more reliable. Another thing I would do, I'd make sure that the revised part would fit on the old truck, so there there wouldn't, if possible, there wouldn't be. Um, you know, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't say, you wouldn't have like a truck that's, you know, a 2020, and then you'd have a truck that's maybe a 2050, you know, year, and all. You know, all the parts from the 50 should be able to fit on the 20, no problem. 
A good example of a vehicle that's been sold for a long time without the design changing is this right here. Yamaha has sold this bike since the mid 80s and they still sell it today and the bike 30 years ago is identical to the one it is to this one right now and they don't change it because it doesn't need to be changed. It's, this thing is perfect the way it is. This thing never breaks and it's just, it's just an excellent motorcycle. Now, a few of my friends, they always go out and buy the most expensive, crazy brands like a Husqvarna or something where the thing gets redesigned every couple years and they have fuel injection. And, and you know what? You can't keep those bikes running. All they're ever doing is fixing them. I never have to fix this thing. All it does is just work. And, and that's the way it should be. You know, there should be no re They should never stop making. See, the thing that's great about them never changing it is it's easy to get parts for it. You could just type in this model bike that they've been selling for 30 plus years and the parts are very easily available and there's no, you know, oh, these parts won't fit it because it's this year or this year range. You know, there's none of that issue. And, and that's how vehicles should be the same way. I mean, what, do they redesign trucks every six years or something? So I was just editing the video here and realized it needed some kind of end. And um, there's a lot more stuff I could say about this truck. It is something I'd probably like to do. Um, I could do it now by building that chassis and just making, using a lot of parts from another vehicle and putting this together. I know that's doable. That's how I was going to do it 10 years ago. But that's not really doing it right. To do it right, I'd really like to... Some of the things that I know I couldn't do right now, the... The powered hubs would be a little tricky because you'd almost have to build a custom electric motor that it'd probably have to be pretty tall and short, or not tall and fat to squeeze in the wheel. And then you'd have to have the geared hub on the end. It'd probably be like a um, planetary gears for the gear reduction for the geared hub. And all that would have to be in that. So that would be a lot of building. Or that would be a lot of design work right there to get that right. You know, a lot of the body could go together pretty easily. That that would that's the whole point of it. That's simple, so I really don't think that would be hard to do. I mean, even one of my friends the other day built a tube chassis vehicle and he had it out last weekend. But you know, all it was was he took the a Volkswagen, you know, the old the old type, and um, and just and just built a f tube frame for it. And, you know, it was working, but, it, you know, by no means was it anything special. Um, it, something like this would be a lot better of a vehicle. So, uh, if anyone has the means and wants to be part of actually getting this to happen, like if Elon Musk is watching or something, you know, that'd be pretty fun to build this thing. So, all right, let me uh, get this video uploaded.